We good to go? Yep, all good. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much for the intro, Dennis. And hello, everyone. My name is Francesco. I'm an AppSec guy, CloudSec guy. And today I want to come to you and I want to share with you a little bit on the trending and recommendation on the journey on cloud security and application security that we see. Um, those numbers are that I'm going to share is a collection between what we see in the various platforms that we're building and I'm going to touch point at the very end, um, as well as some more public available reference from uh, Veracode and other vendors. I collide them all together so that we can uh, have a discussion around numbers and data. I think security is serious enough <laughs> and, and it shouldn't be the case. So I tend to fill my presentation with memes, jokes, and I tend to make them light because security is already um, a heavy subject, a complex subject. If we don't approach it with a smile, we'll never get the collaboration that we want from the virus team in the business. But also we need to work on eight to 16 hours, depending on which organization you're in uh, on a topic. So it's better to do it with a smile. So a little bit about me, because every presentation needs to have a little bit about who's talking to you. So <laughs> I commit to that and uh, this is me. So I am Francesco Cipollone. I'm the director of AppSec Phoenix. We do uh, a lot of work around uh, data, cloud security and application security. I'm also chair of the Cloud Security Alliance and I've been previously involved with a lot of uh, transformation around cloud security and application security in various organizations that you can see below. And I keep on saying security is everyone's job, but um, we need to do it better. We need to collaborate better. We need to remove the stuff that prevent us as a security professional to collaborate with devs, collaborate with the rest of the organization and uh, use a po positive approach, use a positive language with the organization. So today I'm here to talk to you about a little bit of data that we see, then what can we derive from this data? What is the problem on running application security and cloud security program at scale? Uh, and my uh, some of recommendation that uh, you can take and take it with a pinch of salt. This is from my experience and uh, hopefully they are useful. So the problem nowadays, uh, and I think it's, it's quite widespread. So I collected fundamentally the CV information and the number of CV declared um, over the years. And you can see a hockey stick um, ramp up of the number of vulnerability. Now, those could be that we, we're better at disclosing, we're better at registering CV, sometimes too fast at registering CV. I don't know if you have seen the whole drama around uh, Log4j with three or four or five different versions, five different CV linked to some similar version or variant of CV. I think we're getting better at identifying, but also there are there is more code that goes out and there is less time to fix. So if we take major issue that we've seen in the past, like Apache Strat and Heartbleed, those were separated as a major, major case almost by 12 years. Not to say that there wasn't any issue in between like major library or OSS library that open source library that were disclosed or uh, misidentified. But in general, there is less time to fix things. And there is a, an acute cybersecurity shortage because the skills that as a cybersecurity professional we require nowadays as an engineers, it's quite widespread um, with application security coding cloud security being in the mix is already a very complex skill set to have, not to mention the cybersecurity aspect of it. Um, and we see that we have less time to fix application security stuff in the wild. Uh, and just a, a simple example could be the log4j and the spring for shell that were separated by few months or the various NPM libraries that were uh, exploited uh, of recent or the various OSS and library that were exploited. Now we're getting better at protecting open source library and there are a lot of initiatives. So we're probably gonna see less, hopefully variant of this issue, but nonetheless, we need to be vigilant. 
from a cloud perspective, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen in the news, but there have been quite a lot of noise around cloud security. Maybe there have been more research or maybe more researchers trying to probing and breaking security service, specifically with, with Palo Alto historically, Orca, Lightspin, hammering a cloud service more frequently and, and uh, fundamentally slamming it with more vulnerabilities and more testing. So we're testing the cloud much, much better. Um, the scary part is that we're finding things, but the nice part of it is that some of these vulnerabilities, specifically from AWS, the Log4j uh, specifically, or um, I think it was KOCB or a few others, they were re uh, remediated in less than six hours from uh, declaration to actually fix. Some others requires a little bit more effort, like the Synapse service identified by Orca in AWS, it is quite widespread, quite high, and, uh, quite critical, is still present and was discovered in January, was disclosed in January to um, the Microsoft team, and is still there. They haven't fixed it, they, they just issue a um, bulletin on this. Now, because of all this noise around libraries and around cloud, we've seen more regulation coming into the market uh, with the national cybersecurity mandate on SBOM and libraries to declare and more efforts on our side of the pond from NCSC to regulate a little bit more. Uh, there is actually of, um, I don't have the link in the presentation, but I can share it afterward. There is an investigation from the UK government on how to write better application and how to embed application security. So there is more effort in, in focusing on this, especially for national grid. Now, aside with the doom and gloom, and let's switch over to the other doom and gloom that is <laughs> the data that we've seen in the market, that we've seen around, and as I say, this data is a, is a mix and a collection of public available report and our report. So we focus on comparing two things. And uh, the, the premises of the report is comparing the effort on prioritizing vulnerability, refocusing effort on, on, on looking at vulnerability across two landscapes. We take web vulnerability and infrastructure vulnerability because we have more data on this, and it tells a nicer story. So, in general, the 280 days that we've seen several years ago seems to have disappeared, um, with some edge cases still there or some legacy systems still there. But the average resolution time is around 80 to 100 days in the worst case scenario. Now, maybe we've gone a little bit faster and a little bit better. The regulation is getting better. The good news is that we're getting faster resolving vulnerability across the board of the one that we can identify at least. <laughs> the one that we don't see, we don't know about it. And we compare two data sets and two number. That is, uh, we overlay uh, the criticality level. And as it was imaginable or logical, the critical still receive a lot more attention and get resolved faster with 51 average resolution time versus the information on all the low vulnerability. Uh, same for web vulnerability. Luckily enough, the web vulnerability, because of their exposure, uh, get resolved faster. Now, uh, it might be that um, we're getting better at patching, uh, but definitely we're focusing more on application security and web vulnerability. It seems to plateau roughly between medium low and informational. And the numbers between infrastructure and web vulnerability seems to be quite similar. Now, if we start overlaying the sector difference, uh, instead of averaging out, it changed quite drastically. So the mean time to resolution, MTTR stand for mean time to resolution, by type of organization, it's quite consistent uh, with large organization being, of course, slower to move around vulnerability versus the SME and micro that are still on the average around 60, 60 to 70 days. But when we start looking at sector specific information, now we vary quite dramatically. And the one that are more technology focused like retail and uh, technology are faster as resolving vulnerability while public sector and a few others that are more 
away from solving software and solving software issue are maybe this slower. Now we start looking at demystifying if demystification is a thing, uh, prioritization and seeing if prioritization is actually something that works. In general, it works, it works up to a specific percentage and we layer on two factors. We layer on the frequency of scan and how that influence uh, the resolution time. And the results are quite logical. The more you, the more you fix uh, or the more you scan and identify things, the more uh, you develop that muscle, the less days it takes you to fix vulnerabilities. The least you do it, if you do it on a yearly basis, uh, you vary of a resolution time between 67 days and 90 days. So conclusion from this, the more you identify things, the more you embed scanning of a specific problem from a web dust to an infrastructure to um, anything else. And the more you embed this process of reviewing, prioritizing, including that in the backlog of dev team and fixing it, um, we, we're jumping in the part of, of recommendation, but the more you do that as a muscle, the faster you resolve things. So recommendation out of this, fix vulnerability or scan for vulnerability more often so that you can identify. So as a resolution and scan frequency, we, we kind of overlaid the prioritization and, and the scan frequency. So you can see that in general, there is, um, delta between 10 and 15 percent on resolution based on prioritization. Now we start to comparing as well the, how the prioritization works between web vulnerability and infrastructure vulnerability and the results were actually quite interesting because it seems that prioritization doesn't do a lot of improvement for the traditional infrastructure vulnerability. While in application security case, it makes a tremendous difference, uh, up to 30% on the critical and high and the reprioritization of critical and high, while the law and information are logically where a little bit left out. So it was predicted, but uh, the difference in range surprised us a little bit. Now I want, before jumping on how to run program and, and how to run things, I want to touch point maybe on why scanning for vulnerability and why identifying vulnerability is such a complex subject and why it takes time to resolve vulnerability. Well, first of all, we get more tooling <laughs> and I promise you meme, so I deliver you meme. So we, We've seen more tooling coming into the market on identification of, of issues across the board. And uh, this is a slide I use all the time, but the point where fundamentally we identify issue from a code perspective, from a cloud perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, and so on and so forth, are more and more. And if we don't bring a contextual aspect or an intelligent aspect, or on the other side, the gating aspect, and I'm gonna touch in the, in the remediation, we kind of lose this fight because we have a lot of signals and very few people that can interpret these signals. Now, as a security team, we can either win or lose this battle. 90%, a lot of the time we're actually losing this battle because there aren't enough of us. In general, the number of dev versus security team versus ops is increasing. Uh, now, there is fairly a debate around the 70, 750. Some people mentioned the 150. But in general, it's a lot of numbers, a lot of disparison between one security person and developer. So we can't scale security by just scaling human, scaling people. It's key that we do more with less people and we try to automate as much as possible. Now, one element of automation could be, okay, you know what, let's block everything. Every release, if it has critical, high, medium, and low, we block it. It's cool if your organization allows you to do so. 90% <laughs> um, of the time, you won't be as lucky to have an organization that allow you to block a release to production or release 
to something if you have critical. And now you can do that and you can solve that by working with your business. But still, we recommend or I recommend to, to approach security as a, as a risk exercise. And what that does is fundamentally you transfer or, or replace uh, or readjust the ownership of security back to the product owner. And then security becomes a consultant where if you have roughly one security person per 10 teams, you can probably scale with some of these automation, some of these guardrails, some of this consultancy approach to 40 to 70 application per security team. And in a medium to large organization, that's probably covering, probably from a small organization, probably covering the majority of the organization. If it's a larger organization, then the more security team, the more you can cover. But by putting this guardrail, by putting this recommendation, by working with the business and consulting on what's interesting to fix, it's easier and the security team doesn't get as much under pressure. Now, a lot of vulnerability management program or, or security management program or application security program, STAR program works in a three way. And where a lot of organization that I've seen do, do it right or wrong in this particular case is trying to fix a people problem and a process problem just with technology. Now, if you don't have any measurement, if you don't have enough skilled people from a security and development perspective, and if you don't have enough proper process to manage vulnerability, and you try to fix this by adding just tooling and technology to identify problem, you get completely overwhelmed with problem finding, but you don't have a methodology to take those problems into resolution, and you don't have enough skilled people to, or upskilled people, to implement those resolutions. Now, a good balanced way will be to start looking at all the aspects and increasing them gradually and consistently, introducing problem identifier, then based on the result on this problem identifier, developing process and procedures, SLA, targets, gate system, or soft gate system to stop this problem going to production, or at least work and identify what each of those problems are. And based on what the analysis of work is, you start upskilling people. And then you go to the next maturity level. So you improve technology, but then again, you filter that technology and you improve your process and procedure by including the new data feed maybe, or the new data information and the new maturity level that you have with that technology. Again, organizations that are trying to solve this with just purely people or just purely technology is a failure. From a people perspective, we can't scale enough to the organization. If we don't involve the organization, we fail as a security team. And if we're just trying to fix this with a nice shiny tool, we fail again because the process and the people that need to implement the resolution won't support this. So any program of work needs to cover the three aspects. And I want to touch a little bit on the problem of modern world that I mentioned before. Modern, modern application deployment and modern environment need to take into consideration, need to take into account a lot of elements. Infrastructure security, application security, cloud security, but also internal versus external threat, attack surface, and just layering on technology over technology over technology that identify problem in each single areas. It, it, it's not humanly possible to analyze all this stuff for every release. And if you may be lucky, you release once every week. But a lot of organizations do micro release on one a day or even 100 a day from multiple team. And as a security architect or as a security professional, then it's challenging to then pair up with all of them before they release. Sometimes you don't even have the time.
I'm going to stop here for one second if you have any questions so far before we jump in the part of the recommendation and the conclusion. I suppose we're good to go. All right. Now, if we investigate a little bit on the problem side, this is the traditional, if you want, vulnerability management or process management uh, cycle and resolution. And I'm going to say some of the time what we're doing wrong is in several areas. The pre-work is generally speaking never done. So process is never kicked off in a, in a consistent way, in a process way involving and defining who needs to be in there. Not having an asset register definitely hurt the whole kickoff of the process. We just directly jump uh, in assessment, in assessment of a few things that we identify. It is good for a start, but then from an improvement perspective, it's better to have a list of things that you have and then how to assess it afterwards. Then we move into the prioritization and the acting very quickly. And sometimes we do the reassessment. A much more better evolution of the thing is identifying things, first of all, starting with a program of work, identifying who are your security champion, how to, what you need to measure and assess, scan it, convert everything into risk and involve the business. Looking at teams and your attack path, mapping teams to the various uh, things that you have, asset that you have, and looking at attack path, what is more priorities zable, sorry for the English name, <laughs> uh, but looking at things by the value, looking at things but uh, by what's more important to resolve, and then acting on things and reassessing, and then improving with education, SLA, metrics, and measurement. Now, I want to conclude the talk a few recommendations that I kind of sprinkle it in the presentation. Measure everything, release, ticket, trending, SLA, resolution time, because that gives you the data to then decide where to go next. Collaboration is key, because if you just, the security team that says no with the development team, and if you don't have enough data to measure what's going wrong, you don't create that rapport, that interaction with the dev team to actually make security happen because they are your gatekeeper. They are the people that are responsible. Work with your business on objective rather than working on your business with just security requirements. Work on identifying what to fix, what not to fix and having the business supporting your security initiative. If you're lucky enough, just put release gate in your CI CD pipeline based on the scanner information that you have. And if you can keep that balanced, if that create too much friction, agree on a tech debt consumption. Means look at problems, agree on a sprint by sprint on a, on a balance between number of use stories that you build or number of bug fixes that you fix. Agree those SLA and element with the business and then focus on reducing week on week the technology debt. This brings me back to the measure everything. So if you don't have enough data, if you don't have enough decision point, if you don't have enough insights on what's happening underneath, you'll never be able to get ahead of this curve. And maybe on the other side, start small and then grow bigger. So prove a case on a number of um, on a number of examples, a number of test cases, or a number of application and teams demonstrate the value, and then the business is going to go with you on that because you've proven value, you've proven SLA, you've proven that something in change. So, in conclusion, process and procedures, skilled people don't implement technology, contextualize things, prioritize, prioritize work, and collaborate. Or smart, not hard. I appreciate your time today, and I hope this is for the information. This is some of the data that we've seen, some of the process that we've seen, and some of the things that we've seen working. Now, I want to leave 
a little bit of space for question at the end of the presentation, if there are questions. Let me see if there is someone in the chat. There are no questions in the chat. Feel free to pop your hand up and we can unmute you if you would wish to ask a question or you can just pop it in the chat. Okay, quiet. I seem to, to have explained everything or, or I must be extremely good at explaining things. Uh, I think James has yes. added a question to the chat. Can you see that? Yeah. Would you consider AI machine learning as the future of security incident? What can we do to mitigate this? Um, I think I like to demystify the word AI machine learning a little bit. There is uh, a lot of the AI that we see nowadays is just based on what we saw and it's patternizing and it's scaling. So I think technology aids and helps if it resolves a human problem. If you take something that is human insolvable, you apply technology, you apply enough good and bad cases, and then you can scale. We use some of, of, of AI technology, machine learning technology to actually do exactly that at scale, to train algorithms and patterns and identify things or identify what's humanly uh, doable and scaling it out. I think there is a lot, the, the problem on the other side is there is a lot of more easy to use accessible tooling from meta exploit onward have been a lot of more easy to use and accessible tooling. So attacker becoming not only smarter, but is the barrier to attack is lower as well as there are more nation state and attack in between each other that when a world becomes fundamentally interconnected, it tends to be more challenging to defend those. So the skill levels are going up and criminal organizations are, are thinking like business. So they're getting organized, they're hiring, and they're getting structured on identifying what's more pressure and, and what's more easy to attack. So if you think the logic and you apply it in reverse, then it's much easier to protect your organization, your crown jewel, if you think like an attacker. What's exposed over the web? What's attackable? What are your uh, bridge pattern that is from external to internal or through social engineering? So think like an attacker and then defend like a, like a defender, but against an attacker. I hope I'll answer the question, James. Okay, there is another question from Tiago. When you mention agreeing on given level of technology depth with management, POs, et cetera, what are you trying to refer exactly? What are the number of vulnerability pending and mitigation, remediation, dependency on severity, for example? It's a very good question. It can be anything of that. So I, I tend to refer to a security technology debt as things that you pay. So it could be the number of vulnerabilities that you fix week on week is agreeing on a number of use stories that you could solve and that directly link to the complexity of the use stories versus the build stories. So you keep a healthy balance with your release cycle or your program, uh, project owner or program manager or uh, PM, um, project manager or application or product owner, where you agree on a number of balance that you need to keep. And it is, is that together with agreeing on a risk, they give back the power to the PO, to the, um, to the product owner on identifying what to fix, when to fix it, because for example, there might be other risk 
in not going to market that are contrabalanced by a number of risks of application. And if you know that your asset at least externally facing are kind of protected, so your risk level is not too high, you can, have, you can have that kind of structure conversation of, okay, this week we don't fix, next week we don't fix, but the week after we need to fix this kind of priority. E1, P2, because you're getting out of SLAs that will influence your risk level and it will kind of unbalance your build versus fix kind of element. And, and build versus fix is, is a very easy to implement things where you measure the number of bug fixes and the number of um, user story that you implement and create or mean time to resolution versus mean time to open. So how long are the ticket gonna re remains open or how long are you taking to fix a specific vulnerability? And if you need support, there is a number of regulation like PCI DSS, they mentioned there are 30 days to fix critical vulnerability mm -hmm. and more regulation coming into board to fix vulnerability in a quicker way, or at least in a measurable way. But in, in general, the key things is to structure and eat up that technology, that, that security problem week on week. So that it becomes a muscle. The key things is, is scheduling consistent work so that it eats up away from, from creating a pile of problems that then it becomes too big to be fixed. Thank you for the question, Tiago. All right. Denise, Katie, there are other questions on the channel? I don't think so. Any more questions? All right. Nope, if I think that's it. Obviously, if you do think of any questions, um, we've got his details there, or you can reach out to us on Slack and we can get those questions answered for you. Brilliant. Thank okay. you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Stay safe.